Hello and welcome uh, to our next webinar from Q Control on improving quantum hardware with quantum control. I'm uh, Michael Hush and I'm the Chief Scientific, of, Chief, Chief Scientific Officer here at Q Control. Um, sorry, it's a bit early. I'm just <laughs> getting my mouth in order. Um, I'm over in Australia actually while the rest of the team's in LA. So um, it's just before six thanks to some daylight savings. But anyway, uh, on to the rest of the team. So here we have first Yuval. Hey, Michael, good morning and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yuval and I'm a lead quantum automation scientist at Skew Control. And then we have Chris. Hi, I'm a senior quantum control engineer at Skew Control. Uh, Anurag. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm also a senior quantum control engineer at Skew Control. And finally, Mirko. Hello, I'm also a senior quantum control engineer at Skew Control. So we have so many um, fresh faces today because to, today's webinar will be going over the talks that were uh, the rest of the talks that were presented at the APS March meeting. Um, we're going to go for around an hour. Uh, at any point, you're welcome to ask any questions. And after each talk, we'll have a little break where we'll answer some of your questions. If we don't have enough time to get around to it, Dave will send you a follow up email with an answer. So no matter what, you'll get an answer. Um, after you've been to the, this webinar, uh, you'll get an email. In that email, there'll be a survey. Um, we'd really appreciate it if you fill it out. Uh, if you do, it allows us to better improve these webinars and better understand how to uh, improve them. And then you'll also go into a draw for a $50 Amazon gift card. So it's well worth your time. Um, and finally, there will also be a link on that email to set up a call with us if you want. So if you have any follow-up questions, like to hear more about our products or our research, please arrange a time to have a chat with us. So today we're going to have four sections. Um, they're all going to look around a single theme of basically improving gates on real devices, and then looking at um, estimates of how that will how those the improvements to those individual gates in a quantum computer will improve the performance of algorithms. So to start, we're going to look at single qubit gates on IBM Q with Yuval. Then we're going to move to two qubit gates with Merco, and then finally we're going to look at um, how these how we expect that these improvements to gates to improve the performance of um, VQE with NRAG. And finally, um, on a QAOA based uh, vehicle optimization problem with Chris. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Yuval and this presentation is the first part out of two presentations where we are going to show you how reinforcement learning can be used to optimize single and two qubit gates on real quantum hardware without having any prior knowledge of the underlying model. When we think about the future of quantum computation, a clear end goal is to be able to run algorithms that solve meaningful problems. In order to achieve that, we must be able to execute high quality gates, which require a high level of control and optimization. So why are we interested in reinforcement learning? That's because the widely used model-based methods struggle on real devices. Unlike in simulations where model-based methods are successful, on a real hardware, it's much harder to accurately estimate the model parameters the unwanted effects like crosstalk, the annoy sources that are often uncharacterized, and parameters tend to drift over time. All these render the task of model-based learning extremely difficult on real hardware. This is demonstrated in the plot. You can see here the evolution of the qubits population in the presence of a drive. The solid lines are calculated from a simulation that assumes a model taken from the IBM backend and the dots are data points taken from the real device. The exact details are not very important, but you can see clear discrepancies between the data and the simulation. The question that we want to answer today is, can we learn gate implementations without having any physical model of the system? Let's see a simple demonstration of the capabilities of reinforcement learning. Here you can see a reinforcement learning controller that was trained to complete a Rubik's cube with a robotic hand. I won't show you the full movie, but during this movie, this poor robotic hand suffers many disturbances. 
Its fingers are tied, it is covered by a rubber glove, and at some point it is even attacked by a stuffed giraffe. And yet, in the end, it achieves its goal. We show here that reinforcement learning can provide similar benefits also to the control of noisy quantum computers. Reinforcement learning is a type of a black box optimization technique. And it is based on the idea of improving by interacting with the system as described in this chart. We can represent gates by long vectors that, for example, store the real and imaginary part in each segment of a piecewise constant pulse. We then send the candidate gate to the device and evaluate its performance by collecting measurements and calculating a cost function. We then use that information in order to suggest a better candidate. This loop goes on until we find a satisfactory gate implementation. Unlike in many other black box methods, reinforcement learning also gathers intermediate information in order to build an internal model of the system. Let's quickly go over the basic steps of reinforcement learning. In each step, as seen in box A, we use the most recent observation of the system in order to choose the next action. In this case, an action can be two values for the amplitude and the phase of the pulse in the next segment. An action can also be the values of the pulse in several segments. And in general, the number of segments in an action is a hyperparameter of the model. We keep building the pulse step by step, and while doing so, collecting information about the state of the system after each step. A sequence of steps that form a full gate is an episode, as seen in box B. Once we have a full episode, we want to evaluate its performance for that, as seen in box C, we run it in full and collect measurements in order to estimate the state of the system. Finally, as seen in box D, in order to wait out state preparation and measurement errors, and in order to uniquely define the gate, we repeat the full gate a different number of times and calculate the fidelity with respect to the ideal target state in each case. The reward, that we assign to a specific gate implementation is then a function of these different fidelities. And this is the quantity that we wish to maximize. I don't have time in this talk to cover the theory of different reinforcement learning algorithms. I'll just say that we explore different algorithms, among others, the ones that you can see in this list. Now we are going to explore the optimization of a single qubit gate. The gate that we choose to work with is the RX90. It's a very basic gate and any single qubit rotation can be generated using RX90 and Z rotations, which on the IBM device are virtual and therefore ideal gates. The IBM default RX90 is a 36 nanosecond drag pulse that is calibrated on a daily basis. For those of you who are not familiar with the drag scheme, the idea there is to reduce leakage to higher levels outside of the computational space. Leakage is typically one of the main obstacles in achieving shorter gates. Unlike with two qubit gates, the performance of the default RX90 is not far from the T1 limit. So what can be improved? We can still achieve some improvement in the performance and make it even closer to the T1 limit. We can also look for shorter pulses without degrading the performance. And we can also look for robustness over time, which may obviate the need in daily calibrations. Here you can see the progress of the optimization process on the IBM device Rome. Our starting point is a random pulse. The plot shows the mean fidelity versus the reinforcement learning step. When we are satisfied with the fidelity value, we take the final pulse and test it against the IBM default pulse using randomized benchmarking. On the left, you can see a randomized benchmarking experiment done with the IBM default RX90 and a 29 nanosecond Q control optimized pulse of RX90. As you can see, even though the Q control pulse is 20% shorter and should be affected more by leakage, its performance is more than 20% better. On the right, 
you can see the I and the Q components of the optimized and the default pulses. We can even go shorter, up to 12 nanosecond pulses, meaning three times shorter than the IBM default. For these short pulses, as we'll see in the next slide, we can achieve similar performance to the IBM default pulse. Remember that the IBM default is recalibrated on a daily basis. Here you can see the errors as calculated from randomized benchmarking across many days. For this, we always use the same Q-Control optimized RX90 as we find in day zero and compare it to the most updated daily calibrated IBM default. As you can see, both with the 29 and 12 nanosecond pulses, we can achieve similar or better performance than the IBM default on a scale of many days without recalibrating. So what's next? In the next talk of this session, Mirko will show us an improvement of more than 2x that can be achieved with two qubit gates, which in general pose a much bigger challenge on real hardware compared to single qubit gates. On top of that, our next step is to go beyond gates and use reinforcement learning and other black box optimization methods in order to improve the performance of small scale algorithms on real hardware. That's all for me. Please stay tuned for the next presentation. Bye bye. Great. So let's have a look if we've got some questions. I'm also going to set up a poll just to get to know you all a bit better. Um, so while we answer these questions, please fill out um, that poll that I've sent around. So, I've lost my Q&A function. There, I found it, it's on the other screen. So first question is, um, if, I if I understand right in step D, you repeatedly apply sa the same pulse 41 times and that gives you a high fidelity, why? So, so the goal of the repetition is not necessarily to get higher fidelity, but one thing we want, we want the error that we see to be higher than span, because if the gate error is 10 to the minus four and span is 10 to the minus two, then on, all you can see is span. So by acting 41 or more times with the gate, the gate error is amplified uh, and goes beyond uh, span error. That's one uh, important thing. The other thing is that remember that we are not interested in state preparation, but we're interested in gates. And in order to uniquely define it, you need to do a bit more than acting once, because if you act once on the zero state, you want to get a state along minus y, but there are many different operations like Hadamard, for example, that will give you the same thing. So you need to uniquely define the RX90. And for that, you need to have multiple uh, operations and to see that all of them give you the same result. So using these two schemes, our cost function is really a reliable cost function in the sense that if the RX90 is better, then what we see is better. We don't see spam and we don't see some other gates that can do the same state preparation as, as the operations that we're interested in. Yep. And I guess the other thing, to, I'm not sure if it's in this talk, but um, the other thing that we noticed is that these error images we use are indicative of randomized benchmark performance as well. So, but they're much more efficient to be able to measure. Great. Um, so how long did it take to train the agent to find a good pulse? So it depends. Uh, it can change from one device to another, but I can say that in general, uh, typically after something like 30 to 40 minutes, we start to see pulses that outperform the default. Uh, and full convergence can happen around an hour, can be a bit more, but these are the time scales that, that are needed. Uh, and, and one thing that I want to stress is that most of this time is actually overhead due to cloud computation. So if you have access uh, to your own hardware, more than 90% of this time will actually be saved and, and the process should take minutes, not more than that. Yeah. Um, so uh, we might get started with the next talk soon. There's another question about reinforcement learning, but why don't we, we'll watch Merco's presentation and then come back to that. So. Just with regard to the poll, just have a quick look. Also, quite a few of you didn't attend the APS March meeting. So just so you know, a lot of these were originally presented at APS March. So some of the talks have some things around being at a conference, but we'll come back to them and just answer all the questions that you need afterwards here. Um, good to see that a lot of people have cloud access to hardware. And uh, yes, so those, those who have, um, 
I guess the thing is those who are everything that we're showing, uh, you get the most benefit just to, so you know if you can have access to your a real quantum device, whether it's in the cloud or in a lab, and you can um, actually uh, apply um, apply things at the pulse level. Um, so that's all of these automation tools. But if you are just looking to do simulations to better understand um, quantum systems as well, we also have simulation tools and feel free to come talk to us after this. Um, but with that won't be a focus of these talks. Okay, so on to the next presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Mirko Miko. I'm a quantum control engineer at QControl. And today I'll be giving the second part of our presentation series on the application of reinforcement learning to the optimization of quantum gates. In particular, we will focus on improving two qubit gates. Cloud accessible devices are becoming ubiquitous and easy to access. However, one of the most critical factors limiting the performance of quantum computers are its noisy gates. If we want to use quantum computers to solve meaningful problems, we need to reduce gate errors in, in these devices. Two qubit gates are the basic operation that generates entanglement between the qubits of a quantum computer. They also form the basic building blocks for more complex algorithms. For example, you can see a sketch of the quantum circuit for the variational quantum eigensolver, also known as VQE, depicted in this slide. Highlighted are the two qubit gates present in the algorithm. The errors introduced by faulty two qubit gates severely limit the current performance of the algorithm. One could try to improve the gates by starting from a physical model of the system, but this is heavily relies on having an accurate model. For platforms like superconducting qubits, this is not always the case. This is particularly true for multi-qubit devices where unknown Hamiltonian terms strongly affect the dynamics of the system. In the figure, you can see the results of a simple experiment where we applied a two qubit drive and follow the time evolution of the population of the four basis states during the drive pulse. The dashed line represents the dynamic computed from a simulation of the system, where different colors are for different initial states, and the dots are the experimental data. Clearly, the simulation is quite far from the experiment for even a single application of the gate. The question that we want to address is the following. Can we learn good implementations of a two qubit gate without having any physical model? One way to do this is to use reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is known for its ability to deal with massive state spaces and imperfect information. For example, one of the most famous success stories of DeepMind's implementation of a reinforcement learning agent is AlphaStar. This algorithm was able to learn how to play StarCraft II at the highest level of the game, even beating world-class players. These features make reinforcement learning a perfect candidate for gate optimization on a quantum device, where the state space grows exponentially with the number of qubits, and only partial information is available from the measurement of quantum states. We have carried out our experiments on a cloud accessible IBM superconducting qubit device. The system is composed of several, up to seven, fixed frequency transmit qubits coupled to each other via resonators. In this platform, an entangling gate can be implemented through the cross resonance interaction. This interaction arises when one of the two connected qubits is driven at the frequency of the other, effectively implementing a ZX theta rotation of the qubit pair. The current implementation of the CR gate is far from optimal. The gate is very long, lasting for almost half a microsecond. Crosstalk between the qubits lowers the fidelity of the gate, requiring an additional cancellation tone, which adds complexity to the control. An interaction between neighboring qubits introduces dephasing. Meanwhile, the control electronics add a signal distortion, which are difficult to compensate just by calibration. Reinforcement learning can tackle all these challenges by learning an optimal pulse through direct interaction with the device itself. In particular, in our implementation of the reinforcement learning algorithm, the agent builds a full pulse in steps, checking at each step what is the state and the reward obtained with the partial pulse constructed until then. More details on the gate optimization process using reinforcement learning are given by Yuval in his talk. 
part one of this presentation series. Key elements in the optimization process are the cost function that produces a reward for the RL agent and which is used to evaluate the quality of the candidate solution and the learning algorithm used by the agent to formulate new candidate solutions. Important aspects of the cost function are that it quantifies the quality of the solution accurately. This will inform the agent on how to improve the gate, that it is robust to unwanted effects and that it can be computed efficiently as it will be called many times during the learning process. We chose to use a repetition scheme for the cost function where a variable number of repetitions of the implemented gate are applied to different initial states. The reward is then calculated from the fidelity of the implemented quantum state estimated via quantum tomography with the target one. This method allows to quantify the error per gate accurately, overcoming contribution from state preparation and measurement errors, and it is efficient in the number of experiments. Important feature of the agent are that it can deal with noisy estimates of the cost and state, which is the situation with current quantum hardware, and that it can work with large state space, a characteristic feature of quantum systems. For the choice of agent, a plethora of reinforcement learning algorithms were tried. Among the most successful ones were policy gradient, also called PG, and soft actor critic, also called SAC. Here you can see the progress of the learning process of an agent using the policy gradient learning algorithm on a cloud accessible quantum device provided by IBM. Plotted are the mean values of the cost for each step as the learning progresses. When the cost reaches a low enough value, we terminate the optimization and obtain the final optimized pulse. On the left, the default, the default pulse is depicted, while on the right, the optimized one is shown. We evaluate the pulse obtained from the optimization process with a repetition test and compare it with the default pulse provided by IBM. In blue is the infidelity of the default pulse for a variable number of repetitions and in purple is the infidelity of the Q-control optimized pulse. The average error per gate of the optimized pulse is twice as low as the one for the default pulse. We also evaluate the same pulses using the interleaved randomized benchmarking protocol. The plot on the left is for the interleaved randomized benchmarking of the default pulse and the plot on the right for the optimized pulse. According to this measure, the average error per gate of the optimized pulse is 30% better than the default. After demonstrating that we can generate optimized two qubit gates with reinforcement learning, we want to explore other possibilities in improving the gates themselves, like making them shorter. This poses unique challenges to model-based methods as the amplitude of the pulse may enter a regime where assumption about the physical model break. Enforcement learning, on the other hand, can deal with this situation. Another goal that we have in mind is to use the optimized pulse to show improved performance in an algorithm. That's all from me for today. Thank you for your attention. Uh, welcome back again. Um, so the first comment we had, Jean-Paul was asking, can you discuss reinforcement learning here more? I might just take this quickly. So hopefully Mirko mentioned that we were using um, a SAC, uh, what was it called? Sorry, Mirko, what was the specific full name? Um, actor critic. Soft, soft actor soft critic. critic. Um, and also policy gradient. So if you want more information about this, we have two manuscripts in preparation, which will be out soon, which we go into more detail from the research perspective. And just so you know, also this feature is um, currently in production for our product. So if you want to get access to them, they'll also be in the product and fully documented there. Um, and if you have any more questions, please come chat to us about the specifics. Okay, so then your next question for you, Mako, is um, in your experience, does the convergence of the agent ever depend on the initial guess? Are there cases where it failed? So RL in general doesn't uh, require an, an initial guess for the learning uh, procedure. So it does not. Uh, in the case of cloud accessible device, we chose to constrain the action space. That is the choices of amplitude and phases that uh, the agent can choose to build the pulse to be around uh, the default uh, pulse. So that uh, helps the con converge in a lower number of steps to, to a local optima. 
um, so when you decide which algorithm is better, and maybe when you do hyperparameter tuning, do you do it on the real quantum computer every time? So in this case, again, because of the limitation of uh, cloud access, we, we did all these uh, experiments in simulation first to decide which algorithm, which uh, learning algorithms were the most promising. And uh, yeah, after we saw which one, we chose two of the best uh, promising ones and we tried these on the device. And we had an automated procedure to tune the hyperparameters, uh, but this required do a few experiments before the optimization is actually run. But I think, I think it's fair to say once you tune those hyperparameters, they stay pretty much fixed for a specific device. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's right. Um, great. So maybe I think this might be for Yuval from your previous talk. So if the frequency of the qubit changes, maybe your pulse will do a 90 degree rotation. But if you play two pulses in a sequence, they won't be in X pulses necessarily. If you have to adjust the qubit frequency, um, is there a benefit to using the exact same waveform? So our goal in the end is to find robust pulses, whether we use RL or, or RS schemes. And, and the whole point of these robust pulses that if the qubit frequency fluctuated a bit or drift a bit uh, uh, as a function of time, then at least to first order, we won't see it. And the performance of the same waveform is going to be uh, well behaved. Of course, if suddenly the frequency of the qubit changed by 10%, then we'll have to recalibrate. But you know, just to give you some numbers, numbers that the bare frequencies of most of the IBM qubits um, are around five gigahertz. Typical fluctuations are in the megahertz uh, uh, regime. And for this type of fluctuations, our pulses are quite robust. So the same waveform uh, can get high fidelity even uh, if the qubit frequency changes a bit. And we, and we see that consistently with the experimental data that you mentioned, yeah. Yes. Um, maybe anyone can take this. Uh, what is SPAM, um, capital S-P-A-M? Um, Marco, do you want to go? Yep. Uh, with SPAN, we mean state preparation and measurement error. So it's an error that can be generated when you prepare a, a certain initial state or when you measure the state of the qubits. Yep, exactly. Um, we have one final question before we go to the next section. So does qubit mapping matter? What's the impact when the um, mapping changes? So I guess I can take it. So we are doing these optimizations for a specific uh, set of, of qubits. Um, and in general, ideally for any pair of qubits, for example, we would like to optimize uh, uh, its own gate. Of course, maybe in the future, if devices will be more homogeneous and, and qubits will behave in a similar way, we won't have to do it. Uh, but these days, the Ver variability is huge and different qubits in the same device behave very, very differently. So it's quite important for each pair for example, to optimize its own C0 and so forth, yeah. Yeah, and in terms of mapping and that kind of problem, we, we have been in looking into that. And in the future, we're gonna be releasing a product Fire Opal, which is really aimed at that uh, algorithm stage and basically including these quantum controls automatically if you're running them on a targeted real device, um, like IBM or Rigetti or uh, INQ, whatever the provider is. So um, yeah, we, we're looking to also basically add smarts into our products to take into account the errors and controls and put that into the compilation stage as well. Um, great, so with that section ended, well, now we're gonna move from uh, the design of the pulses to actually seeing the improvements they can give in real algorithms. And so our next talk will be from NRAG. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Anurag Mishra, a senior quantum control engineer at QControl. We are currently in the near term intermediate quantum era or the NISC era. The noisy nature of current generation quantum computers makes quantum algorithms that require very low noise, such as the Scholes algorithm, impractical. In recent year, hybrid quantum classical algorithms have emerged as the only practical alternative on these noisy quantum computers. Such algorithms are thought to provide some resistance to specific noises on devices. But how true is this claim with more realistic error models? Today, I will talk about the impact of noise on NISC error algorithms and how error-robust controls designed using the Q-Control optimizer 
can suppress noise and enhance the performance of quantum algorithms. Let us discuss the very popular variational quantum eigen solver or the VQE algorithm, which has been used to find the ground state energy of small molecules, solve small condensed matter problems, etc. It is a prototypical NISC era hybrid quantum classical algorithm. A quantum computer prepares a parameterized quantum state called an ANSATS, and a classical optimizer optimizes a cost function which is generated from the quantum state. Starting from a random or a heuristic based set of parameters, the classical optimizer searches the parameter space using this hybrid classical quantum loop. The calculation stops when the cost function converges to an optimal value. When the cost function is the expectation value of an observable, the variational theorem guarantees that this optimal value is an upper bound on the minimum possible value of the observable. Tight bounds can be obtained by carefully choosing the ANSATs. To analyze the impact of noise on quantum algorithm, let us first consider how external noise sources interact with a quantum device at the pulse control level. Many superconducting qubit devices use the cross-resonance interaction to implement one and two qubit gates. The device control Hamiltonian can be broken down into two parts, the single qubit control and the two qubit control. We can manipulate these controls to implement various gates. In the cross-resonance model, all single qubit unitary gates can be created by combining the X90 pulse with Z rotation. The X90 pulse rotates the state vector by 90 degrees along the X axis on the block sphere. Z rotations rotate state vectors and combine their X and Y components. While the single qubit Hamiltonian does not contain any Z term, virtual Z rotations can be obtained by manipulating the X and the Y component of the control pulse omega. A two qubit cross resonance pulse called CR90 can be combined with the X90 pulse and a virtual Z rotation to create the C0 gate. The C0 gate, along with single qubit unitaries, forms a complete gate set for all quantum circuits. For details of the cross resonance and other superconducting qubit model, please refer to Kranz et al. These single and two qubit controls are represented by segmented functions. On each time segment, the control strength remains constant. Our cross-resonance simulator simulates each of these time segments in a time-ordered fashion. Solving either a unitary evolution or a Liu Williams simulation, depending on the interaction of qubits with the external sources of noise. So what exactly happens when we add noise to these cross-resonance simulations? Here, we consider a combination of two kinds of noises, a non-Hermitian qubit relaxation noise with time scale T1 and a Hermitian noise of constant strength, a coherent over-rotation noise. These noise shows up as decaying single qubit gate performance in benchmarks. Notice that we do not subject the two qubit cross resonance channels to any noise. On the left, we show the result from repeated application of X180 pulses where the over-rotation errors accumulate and cause periodic oscillations in fidelity from the ideal state. On the right, randomized benchmarking shows DK in fidelity with increasing Clifford gate application. For these results, we have adjusted the noise parameters T1 and delta such that the results match the experimental results seen on an IBM superconducting device. Please refer to Carvalho et al. for all for more detail about the experimental work. Can we improve benchmark performance under this noise? We remember that the X90 pulse is used to construct single and two qubit gates. A carefully designed X90 pulse can protect gates from various noise processes on the device. For this work, we used a model-based pulse optimizer provided by the Q-Control Boulder Opal software. In this model-based pulse optimization approach, we provide the details of the system Hamiltonian and the noise Hamiltonian to the optimizer and ask it to produce an optimal pulse that can implement the target gate. The Q-Control optimizer generates a cost function, which is a sum of two terms. One term measures the distance between the pulse and the target gate, and the second term measures the robustness of the pulse to the noise sources. The optimizer then applies state-of-the-art optimization techniques 
to find the optimal pulse. Here, we use the Q control optimizer to generate pulses that suppress the over rotation noise. For more information about the optimizer, please refer to the to work done by Ball et al. Gates implemented using the robust pulses are completely immune to coherent over rotation noise. The robust pulse completely cures the oscillation seen after repeated application of X180 pulses, and the error per Clifford goes down by 2X in randomized benchmarking experiments. This is again in the line with results seen on an IBM superconducting device. The gates are now T1 limited. Let us now consider a concrete case, finding the ground state energy of the hydrogen molecule. We will use the CCSD ansatz over four molecular orbitals. We will use the parity qubit mapping to encode the electronic fermionic Hamiltonian to a qubit Hamiltonian. Two qubits were eliminated by qubit tapering algorithm, and we are left with a two qubit Hamiltonian. The CCSD ansatz required for this problem can be generated using an ansatz circuit of three parameters shown on the right. We diagonalize the two qubit Hamiltonian to find the exact ground state energy of the molecule. This value will serve as the benchmark for our VQE simulations. When we run the VQE loop for the hydrogen molecule problem, we start noticing the impact of the noise at the algorithm level. Using the existing approach with primitive pulses shows the performance reduction with the noise. The minimum energy found is far away from the true energy. This is represented by the lowest most point on the graph. Next, we look at a case where we run the simulations with T1 noise, but no over rotation noise. We call this the T1 limited case. Energy found by T1 limited VQE is very close to the true ground state energy. Next, we ran VQE with both kinds of noise and used the Q control robust pulse. As we see, the result is 93% closer to the true minima and matches the one found in the T1 limited case. Thus, we have verified again that the Q control robust pulse completely suppresses the impact of over rotation noise at the algorithm level. As a sneak preview, let me also show you the results obtained from the simulations on a simple toy model transport optimization problem. On the left, we see a graph describing the transport problem. Given a single depot with one vehicle, what is the optimal route to visit each node once? We solve this problem using the VQE algorithm with and without over rotation noise in the simulations. Q control robust pulse show a 200x enhancement with respect to the existing approach and again completely suppress over rotation noise. My colleague Chris Bentley will discuss this detail in his next talk. In summary, we have shown that the coherent noise processes play an important role on realistic devices and hinder algorithmic performance. The Q control optimizer can create pulses which are robust to such noise and boost the performance of NISC error algorithms. In future, we want to enhance our simulation to also accurately capture the two qubit noise processes. We will also work towards reproducing these results directly on an actual hardware device. Thank you for watching this presentation from Q Control. If you have any questions, you can reach out to the team by going to qcontrol.com. Great. Welcome back again. Um, and just to highlight, you don't have to go to qcontrol.com. If you have any questions, you can just answer them right here. Just hit that Q&A button. Um, I might just build the first question. So it was a follow-up to what Yuval had answered before. Um, so we, we had someone ask, so that it isn't quite what was asked before. What he's meant to say is if the qubit frequency changed by a megahertz, um, if you play your two pulses, 500 nanoseconds apart, and nanoseconds apart uh, one will do an X90, one will do something a little bit different. I guess what I want to just highlight there is that um, on these real devices, all of the uh, Z rotations in between things are done virtually. So there's just, there is no time delay. And I would also say that um, you don't see the detuning changing very quickly. So although it can drift, it tends to drift on the scale, of a much slower scale, on the scale in between, far between gates, on the scale over basically minutes or so. 
um, as the device sort of like going under the thermal fluctuations, et cetera. So you don't tend to see, I don't think that the, um, in the end, the like, the errors with detuning in between gates don't make a very significant contribution to the error. Um, so one next question. Uh, it seems that the error bar on Q control is even smaller than the perfect one. Um, is that a statistical artifact? Uh, yes, in this case, it is a statistical artifact because it's a small toy problem and we are taking like limited number of readouts. Uh, so let's just, yeah, uh, measurement statistical error. Yeah, just, just random chance, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we're very honest, so we just show the <laughs> random chance that occurred, at least. Um, so do these results depend on the noise model? The next question. Uh, yes, so like the exact magnitude of the result that you will see depends on the noise model and the interplay between the noise model and your classical optimizer. So you could have some noise models where classical optimizer can help you a bit to mitigate that noise. But regardless, if you have robust pulses, the ansatz preparation part, of the quantum part would perform better. And then the overall interplay between the quantum classical loop just improves and you'll get better results. Great. Um, we're getting a little bit close to the end. So we might just start with the final presentation and then we'll field the rest of the questions at the end. So again, if you have any questions as we go along, just hit that Q and A button. Hello, I'm Christopher Bentley, a senior quantum control engineer at QControl, and I'll be presenting our work on optimized quantum solutions for vehicle routing problems. We rely on transportation for our work and leisure, for supplying our food and medicine, and to underpin the infrastructure of society. The efficiency and efficacy of transportation directly impacts our well being. Providing an efficient and effective transport network relies on solving optimization problems, including staff and vehicle scheduling, logistics planning, and operational management of traffic. A key example is the vehicle routing problem, or VRP, which is about the optimal paths and timing of vehicles traveling around a transport network to meet particular travel or supply requirements. This is a generalization of the traveling salesman problem where the vehicle routing problem treats multiple vehicles instead of one. There are also well-known extensions to the VRP that make it more practical for realistic transport scenarios by adding constraints, such as the capacitated VRP or CVRP, the VRP with pickup and delivery or VRPPD, and the VRP with time windows, VRPTW. Or for all of these constraints together, the CVRP PD TW. There is a rich history and literature for treating these problems, and the reference shown is an overview of classical approaches. Importantly, finding the optimal solution for the VRP is known to be NP hard. Quantum optimization algorithms exploit the properties of quantum mechanics such that the calculation methods are fundamentally different from classical algorithms. For problems that are known to be hard for classical algorithms, quantum algorithms offer a different computing methodology with known or potential advantages. In the case of classical optimization problems, quantum annealing or variational quantum algorithms such as QAOA or quantum approximate optimization algorithms are promising computational candidates for combinatorial optimization problems such as the BRP. To apply any such quantum approach, first the target problem must be prepared or mapped in such a way that the given algorithm can be applied. Then the algorithm can be implemented on an appropriate device where the device and its limitations in terms of qubit resources and noise must also inform the problem mapping and algorithm preparation. In this presentation, I'll briefly discuss the mapping process and then focus on the implementation of such algorithms. Mapping the vehicle routing problem for quantum algorithms involves a few steps. The problem specifications must be known, such as whether we are treating vehicles with a capacity limit, along with the transport network composed of the demand or supply locations and the cost associated with traveling particular paths. The cost should be written in a binary form along with the constraints that forbid illegal paths, 
such as violating capacity constraints or teleporting vehicles. The binary variables can be represented by qubits in a problem Hamiltonian, which can then be transformed into algorithm operations for digital computing as shown for the QAOA algorithm. The, the operations can be decomposed into quantum circuits, which should be optimized according to the particular quantum hardware constraints and performance. The digital quantum circuit is then obtained, such as the example shown for a variational quantum algorithm which is the case we consider for this presentation. One key note here is that current hardware is limited in the number of available qubits. This means that mappings for near-term implementation should minimize the number of required qubits, unlike the classical algorithms. When it comes to implementing quantum circuits on real hardware, the performance of the gates is a critical resource. The gate performance constrains the performance of the algorithm as a whole, and the quality of the optimization results thus directly depend on the gate performance. By replacing conventional operations with noise or error robust operations, the gate and algorithm performance can be enhanced when it is run on the quantum computing hardware. Our model-based robust optimized gates have been validated on real hardware. These results are on an IBM machine showing the error in parallel single qubit operations on the chip for different days. The robust gates offer higher performance with full, fully parallel operation. They suppress fabrication variance between the qubits, simplify calibration, and extend the useful calibration window by around 10 times. For details of our error robust controls, you can take a look at the archive paper shown here. So what does this mean for algorithm simulation? We have developed a realistic model-based algorithm simulator to incorporate hardware noise channels. This includes qubit relaxation noise and coherent noise such as over-rotation errors due to calibration errors or parameter drift. Algorithms are composed of many gates. By modeling repeated gates under the influence of these noise channels, the sustained high fidelity performance of the Q-Control robust optimized gates is clear, in contrast to the fast fidelity decay of the primitive gates with their repetition. For more detail on the simulator and the error robust controls, please take a look at Anurag's pre preceding talk in this session, which is available on demand. In order to accurately simulate real hardware noise channels, the simulation parameters have been chosen based on results on an IBM device. We will soon be doing algorithm demonstrations on real hardware. And for progress towards this work, you can check out the talks by Yuval and Mirko demonstrating improvements to two qubit gates on quantum hardware. Turning back to the vehicle routing problem, we applied our simulator to transport network problems of different sizes to assess the algorithm performance. Firstly, we checked that the ideal algorithm without including noise sources performed well for the routing problem that it actually obtained optimal routing paths. This was indeed the case. For instance, for the six node network shown, we found that the algorithm outputs the optimal route 99.8% of the time. This percentage comes from the fact that we sample from the distribution of route outputs from the quantum computation and the resulting probability of obtaining the optimal route is called the success probability. The high success probability for this non-trivial scale problem gives us positive indications for obtaining optimal routes when we scale up the transport network. Next, we applied our realistic algorithm simulator to model the optimization of a smaller scale three node network, including coherent over rotation errors. The VQA algorithm circuit is shown where the purple boxes are single qubit rotations. The parameters for these single qubit rotations are optimized by the algorithm and the noise impacts their implementation. We will look at replacing standard square pulses with operations that have been optimized to be robust to the given noise channel. The performance difference between the algorithm with the primitive pulses and the robust pulses is marked. For this simple network, a false local minimum exists with a cost value very close to the optimal value. And this minimum can trap instances of the optimization algorithm. For this reason here, five to 10 iterations of the algorithm are applied, 
where we used random initial values of the optimization parameters that characterize the circuit. The success probability is taken from the best run and as before represents the probability of obtaining the optimal route and associated cost from the algorithm. In the top figure panel, we look at calibration noise. Here, a fixed amplitude noise is added to the I and Q channels throughout a given application of the algorithm. The dimensionless noise value on the x-axis scales from 0 to 0 0.1, which should be considered in reference to the scale of the I and Q channels between minus 1 and 1. The algorithm with robust pulses has much lower susceptibility to calibration noise. Its success probability is sustained close to 1 as the noise increases, while the same algorithm with primitive pulses has a success probability that quickly decay, decays close to 0 in contrast. The robust pulse algorithm has success probability up to 80 times better for calibration noise. The lower panel shows noise that changes for each application of a circuit within the algorithm. In this case, the x-axis noise values are the standard deviation of the zero mean normally distributed random noise. The robust pulse algorithm is again much less susceptible to this noise. The success probability decays much faster for the primitive pulse as the standard deviation of the noise values grows. The robust pulse algorithm has success probability up to 30 times better for per circuit random noise. Given that a quantum algorithm can solve the vehicle routing problem and that algorithms comprised of robust pulses can successfully contend with realistic noise channels, what comes next? The large scale target here is to obtain quantum advantage where a quantum algorithm provides superior performance over classical algorithms for real transport problems. To reach towards this goal, larger devices are needed, along with ongoing assessment of the problem mapping and the performance of the chosen algorithm. The implementation on real devices will need to occur in parallel with continued pulse optimization in response to the dominant noise sources that limit hardware performance. These noise robust pulses will in turn provide better performance on the hardware and facilitate analysis of the remaining dominant error sources. As the number of available qubits grows and the circuit performance improves, we will be able to optimize larger transport networks. As the size and complexity of the transport problems grow, we will have a clearer understanding of the relative performance of quantum and classical algorithms or a hybrid ap approach, as in the paper shown, and we will have a clearer understanding of the best paths or problems for obtaining quantum advantage. Thank you for watching this presentation from QControl. If you have any questions, you can reach out to the team by going to qcontrol.com. Welcome back again. So we have a question already in. Um, Chris, what is the basis of mapping? Oh, sorry. What is the basis of mapping the best route? Sure. So I, I think this is asking what the variables represent in the mapping. Um, if you think of those uh, schematics of those graphs with the, the nodes that you're trying to visit and the depot um, or distribution point or central localized point for the vehicles, um, the variables here are the edges on this graph. Um, and so these edges, um, you need to denote them by the nodes that they connect. And also, if you have multiple vehicles, you might need a vehicle index, um, which increases the number of qubits that you need uh, to represent all of the paths um, in this mapping. There are different choices for this mapping, um, but this type of mapping is the one that we found to be most effective. Great. Um... Why is success probability the measure of choice? So success probability gives you um, the probability that your optimizer obtains the optimal route within this graph. Um, and so this is an effective measure, particularly when you know what the optimal route is. And it helps us when we're scaling up from smaller scale problems, so test cases up to larger scale, uh, more realistic network sizes. Um, but what you're really interested in here is how this success probability changes as you change the size of the network. 
um, or add to the complexity of, of the problem that you're looking at to make sure that in these test cases you're performing well and then you're still regularly obtaining or with high probability obtaining the optimal routes um, as your network gets more complex. So I think I think we've got one more question then um, we might end the seminar, so, I mean webinar. So um, final question is, oh, here we go. Uh, the traveling salesman problem is mapped via permutation matrix to avoid subloop tours. Um, how does your encoding avoid subloop tours, et cetera? Sure. So uh, there are, I guess, when you move to the vehicle routing problem and when you're allowing, um, for instance, multiple trips of the vehicles, um, this gets more complicated than the traveling salesman problem case. Um, and you can add constraints that remove the subloops. So we've just added um, a set of constraints to the cost. Um, or it depends on the way that you implement your algorithm. Um, but these are specifically treated uh, through the mapping, through the cost or the constraints. Yeah. Um, we have a question about, can I get an article to the measure of choice? Um, perhaps a better way to just to kind of tie up, maybe better if you hit a link at the end of the webinar, um, as everyone leaves, you get an email to follow up and you're welcome to set up a call with us um, and we'd be happy to share any more detailed references. Um, also, this webinar we put up uh, afterwards um, uh, on our YouTube channel and uh, there are also these, uh, and then you'll be able to like check any of the references that have been provided in any of the talks as well. Um, so once again, thank you all for attending. Um, there'll also be a link to a survey at the end of this um, webinar in an email. Please fill it out. Uh, it'll give us a bit of information about how to improve these webinars and also put you into the chance to win a $50 Amazon gift card. So it's well worth the time. Um, so first for me, so thank you all for attending and uh, I'm sure the panel will join me in saying thanks as well. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.